Welcome to our gospel service. We're just going to commence now with our time of praise. And the first thing, one we're going to sing is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. next one we're going to sing God sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he lived and died to buy my pardon I'd like to thank the Lord tonight for his grace and his mercy and his love that has been poured out upon us through his son the Lord Jesus tonight for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life what a loving God we have to worship this evening. God sent his son, they called him Jesus.
next one we're going to sing. There is a story sweet to hear. I love to tell it too. It fills my heart with hope and cheer. Tis sold yet ever new. I really love these old hymns. So let's really sing this in praise to the Lord this evening. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child, and forever I am. Forever. 
There's nothing better than singing praises unto the God of heaven. We're going to commence now our service with our opening hymn, Jesus, my Saviour, to Bethlehem came, born in a manger to sorrow and shame. And we'll stand for our opening song after introduction, please. Let's bow together in prayer and let's ask for the Lord's help. Our God and our Father, again we come quietly into your presence tonight. We're so thankful for this means of grace that is afforded to us that we who know and love the Savior can come right into your very presence by faith we come, our Father, at your invitation, for you have invited us to come, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in all our times of need. Father, we bow humbly before your throne of grace. We recognize that you are the only true and living God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the God of our salvation. We thank you that you are the great creator God, the one who has made all things and the one who sustains all things by the word of your power. Father, we bow before you acknowledging in a world of great chaos and confusion that our hearts are thrilled to know that God is still on the throne and that he will remember his own. Father, as we bow before you tonight, we want to thank you for the many blessings that you give to us day after day. Thank you for the blessing of food and clothing, 
health and strength. Thank you for our homes. Thank you for our fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you to our Father for the opportunity we've already had to meet together this morning in various ways. We thank you for Sunday school and Bible class. We thank you for every one of our children and all our young people. We do thank you, our Father, for the opportunity to meet around your word today and then to remember our Lord Jesus Christ in his own appointed way. That again has been a great privilege for us. And so, our Father, we want to acknowledge again your goodness to us and your grace upon our lives. But, Father, we have come together tonight that we might know your blessing upon us as we come to sing your praise. Our Father, as we come to read and to meditate upon your word, we ask that we might know the help of God the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for those who have been able to come out, and we commend each one of us to you. We thank you for those who will join us tonight on Facebook Live. And likewise, for them, we pray that God would richly bless them. Very conscious, our Father, that right across our land just now, there are so many meetings that are taking place. There are missions ongoing and some of them will come to a close tonight too. We think of the meetings out in Scarva and we pray for God's blessing upon those meetings and this closing night of the mission. We pray, our Father, that you would bless your word wherever it is preached. Father, we thank you that it is the entrance of your word that brings light. And we recognize that even with all the preaching, our Father, that will take place this evening, we recognize that we live in dark days and many people are living in darkness and they don't know anything about God's salvation nor God's lovely Son who came to purchase for them a so great salvation. So would you bless everything that takes place in this building and would you bless everywhere else where the word of God is preached? We remember those who have gone out from our church to serve you in other places. We ask God's blessing upon them. We think especially of the team out in Fatima, and we commend them to you. We pray for Colin and Carol. We pray your blessing upon Phil. We think of Eddie and Tanya, and we ask, O oh God, for the other members of that team, that God would bless them in these days as they seek to give out Christian literature to reach the darkness of that world that those people are living in. Remember all those who are laid aside at the moment, those who find themselves in hospital, those at home, those are, Father, who are under the weather, both physically and spiritually. Gracious God, there are so many people with so many needs, but we thank you that in your grace you can meet each one of them at the point of their needs, so we commend them to you tonight and ask for God's blessing. Hear our prayers then as we come just now quietly before your throne of grace. Bless each one of us and glorify your name as a result of our coming together. We ask it all for the sake and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I take this opportunity to welcome you all to our evening gospel service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who are visiting with us this evening and those who are tuning in by Facebook Live. Pastor Taylor will continue his series insights from Isaiah this evening and then after meeting Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m. through to 9 p.m. and the pickup for the young people by the parents will be at 9.15. Just the announcements in coming week on Monday, the warm room uh, is at 10.30 a.m. in the church hall. And if you know anyone that could avail of this, please invite them along. Then on Monday evening at 7.30, the craft class, and that's in the church hall, and all ladies are welcome to that meeting. Then on Tuesday, the toddler group at 10.30 a.m. in the morning, and then at 6.45, we have the Good News Club. Then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m., 
Pastor Taylor will be speaking on the prophecy of Amos. And then on Friday, the Bible study recommences at 12, 15 p.m. with our elder, Woody Price. Also on Friday night, we have the Youth Club at 7.30, and that's for all year eight to year 12 young people. Then next Lord's Day, Sunday school and Bible class at 10 a.m. Church services will be running at the usual times of 11.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Pastor Taylor will be speaking at both services next Lord's Day, and the singer in the evening is Ruth McRoberts. The children's talk next Lord's Day will be Adam MacDonald. Children's church will be Johnny and Jenny Finney, and children's crash will be Diane Madeley, Yvonne McCrum, and Kristen Ginneth. Just announcing to the ladies, the ladies' Christmas dinner is on Tuesday the 3rd of December. There are sheets in the foyer with the menu and details of what is happening this year. Please take one if you weren't at the ladies' meeting and would like to attend that dinner. All ladies and their friends will be made very, very welcome. Just to mention this morning uh, that George and Claire was talking about the shoebox appeal. If you weren't out this morning, they're collecting shoeboxes full of gifts uh, for the Samaritan's Purse. And if you want any, for, any, any more information, there's still shoe boxes in the hall that can be collected. And maybe George or Claire would speak to you on the way out this evening. We didn't mention this morning, but we thought we would mention it this evening. The harvest service will be on the 27th of October. And we will be asking next Lord's Day for food to be donated uh, on that day. And all the food that will be collected will be given to a local food bank. So if you can help in any way with non-perishable food, we're giving you a prayer notice now that we will make an announcement next week for foods to be brought in, and any of that food will be donated to a good cause. These are all the announcements, and they're made subject to the will of the Lord. We're going to sing another hymn. We're going to change our position again, and then Pastor Taylor will come and bring the word of God. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. <clears throat>
Amen. Thanks to Mark for leading us tonight in our time of praise. Lovely to see you along. If you're visiting with us, we thank you most sincerely for coming and for joining with us tonight. Now, some folks had said they'd like to go for the last night, the closing night of the mission in Scarva. So I'll not keep you all night. I promise that there's no singers. So turn with me and we'll read some verses in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, and reading the first 12 verses. Isaiah chapter 2, sorry, verses 1 through to 12. Let's listen to God's word. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures, their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made, and the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. The last time you were thinking about these lovely verses in Isaiah, we looked at Isaiah 1, 10 to 20, where we noted a sincere plea to a sinful people. The opening verses of this great book, we can see that God's people were in a desperate place, but they didn't know it. They were living under the judgment of God, but they couldn't grasp it. And they were convinced that they were all right, when in reality, they didn't realize they were far from God. And God had every right to move his hand in judgment upon his people, but instead he reached out to them in love, and he said to them, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What a great statement that is from the heart of a loving God. His people were rebellious children. They were sick with sin and they were spiritually bankrupt. And God had every right to deal with them and to pour out his judgment upon them. But he didn't do that. Instead, in grace and in mercy, God reached out his hand toward them and he extended this loving invitation. They deserved nothing. 
And yet God said to them, come now, let us reason together. This was God's invitation. God, seeing the state of his people, took the initiative, and he reached out to them, even in the midst of the awful sin that marked their lives at that time. But this was an urgent invitation. God would not put up with their sin forever. And that's why God said to them, come now, don't trail your feet. Come now, let's reason this out. And of course, when it comes to the whole matter of God's salvation, it's the same, isn't it? You and I, when God says to us, come now, accept my offer of mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ, that means come now. We could trail our feet spiritually. We could delay and miss a God-given opportunity, and we could slip out into a lost eternity. That's why God says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But God also said something else to them. God was willing to pardon them. We know that because he extended this loving invitation. They had broken his covenant, forsaken his law, but God wanted to pardon them instead of punishing them. And he was willing to prosper them, for he said to them, if you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. If they were willing to repent, God would forgive their sins, God would heal their land, God would bless them and restore to them those days when his presence was so real amongst them. But if they wouldn't change their ways, God said to them, that he would one day punish them. He said, if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. And God simply says to his people, to whom he extends this loving invitation, if you come to me, you repent of your sin, I will bless you abundantly. But if you don't come, instead of a pardon, there will be pain and there will be punishment because you have not only rejected me, but you have rejected my laws. And of course, the Bible tells us that this is true of all of us, because whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Tonight we come to these verses here <coughs> in Isaiah 2, and I'm going to mention some hindrances to salvation. Now, when we come to the opening verses of Isaiah 2, I want to make it very clear here that those verses, right through perhaps until Isaiah 6, that they're dealing with not the present time for them, but they're dealing with a future time because the prophet is speaking about the millennium kingdom. But I'm going to come tonight and I'm going to pick out some things about God's people at that time because they are vitally, vitally important. Some of these things are hindrances to those who will not seek God for salvation. But they are also a warning to the child of God. Don't do what they did. Don't do what they did. Because if you do, you will bring the hand of God in judgment upon your life. And here in Isaiah 2, some hindrances to salvation. There's no doubt there are many people tonight, and when you talk to them, whether it be in our own homes or whether it be in the community, people who are not yet saved, when you talk to them about the urgency of God's salvation, they have a number of reasons, too long a list to number, but they have a number of reasons as to why they will not come to Christ. There are some who will say to us, well, listen, I'm too young. I'm too young. I leave it until another time, and when I am older, I will think about these matters, because after all, I have my whole life ahead of me. How do you know that? How do you know that? There are people who die in old age, and there are people who die in young years, and they never see old age. The time to get right with God is now. Whether you're young or whether you're old, it is time to seek the Lord. Some will say, ah, but hold on. I have my own faith, and that's enough for me. Some will say, I do the best I can, and I know that my best will one day assure me 
of a place in heaven. There are many reasons tonight why so many people will not accept God's invitation in the gospel. When you look at these people here in Isaiah's day, God extended the loving invitation. We have already noted that. But these people continued in their sin, and they continued to rebel against God. When God said, come to me, let's reason this out. Let's deal with the matter of your sin. Come in repentance and in faith, and I will heal you, and I will cleanse the land. But they wouldn't come. The draw of sin was too much. So they wouldn't respond. And of course, God had to warn them and tell them of a day coming in the future when he would deal not only with Judah, but also Israel. But we can see here in these verses some things that are practical for us tonight. And I want to mention them to you. These are perils, pitfalls, as to why maybe tonight you are not a Christian, or as to why tonight you are not going on with God. Some hindrances to salvation. Number one, there is the peril of riches. Look at what we read, verse 5. O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, are soothsayers like the Philistines. They please themselves and the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land also is full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Now remember whenever God set his seal upon his own people, he chose them to himself. They were his own special people. God says, I will be your God and you shall be my people. But God's people have now lost their distinctiveness. And not only that, they've lost their identity. They have mingled with the other nations around them and they had accepted their customs and their practices. We know that because they'd become like the Philistines who were once their enemies. They'd introduce soothsayers. They had those who could read the stars. There were those who could tell the future. And in all of these worldly pursuits, these people, God's people, were getting further and further away from him. They were practicing things that God condemned. In fact, God had forbidden it time and time again down through the history of his people. But the problem was that they had so much they didn't need God. How do we know that? But their land was full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. These people were exhorted to depend on God alone. They wouldn't do it. They didn't do it. The land was full of luxury. Their homes were full of treasure. There was an abundance of horses, chariots, and their hunger and their thirst for these things, worldly things, took them away from their God. And the saddest thing of all about this is this. They actually thought that they had plenty, when in reality they had nothing because they had deserted their God, forsaken his law in order to satisfy themselves. Let me say this, there's no harm in being rich. So long as we use what we have for God and for his glory, but if our riches and our earthly possessions and all that we hold dear to our hearts and all our worldly pursuits are the only thing that matters to us in life, then our priorities are entirely wrong. Sometimes when we have too much, we feel no need of God. 
and we no longer depend on him. But the truth is that all the money in the world and all the possessions that you and I could accumulate, they will matter absolutely nothing in eternity if we don't have Christ. Didn't Jesus say that only in a different way when he turned around and he said to those who were of his day, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? and lose his own soul. Gaining the world appeals to the worldly mind. But Jesus says in pursuit of it, you could lose your own soul, and that's a great mistake. The foolish farmer in Luke chapter 12 thought that he was doing so well, he'd build bigger farms, he would extend his properties, he would do all that he needed to do, and then one day he said, soul, so, we have much of world's goods. I'm going to sit down and take it easy. I've my fortune made. I'm going to enjoy my retirement. And God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. These people in Isaiah's day were in danger of losing so much by trying to gain everything. And in their pursuit, they forsook God, oppressed the poor, neglected the widows, and worst of all, they were getting further and further away from God. What good is money? What good are possessions? If we don't have Christ, what good are things if we don't have the one thing that really matters, and that's salvation? Him writer gets it right. Room for pleasure, room for business. But for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in our hearts for which he died. Thomas Fuller said it like this, riches may leave us while we live, but we must leave them when we die. That's an interesting quote, isn't it? He's so right. You can take nothing with you when you go. So make sure while you're here, the one thing that you're deeply concerned about is God's so great salvation. There's the peril of riches. Secondly, there's the peril of religion. Look at verses 8 and 9 for a moment. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive them not. Here's a land that was not only full of riches, it was steeped in religion. But this was not the true religion that was centered upon the true and living God. This was a religion that was built on falsehood and built on superstition. Whenever God called these people, he made them his own. And he gave them laws, and he gave them rules, and he gave them regulations. It wasn't to make their life difficult, it was to make their life better. It was bringing them into a closer relationship with God so long as they believed and they adhered to all that God had said, it would deepen their enjoyment of their relationship with God. But that fellowship with God was broken. They neglected his word. They rejected his laws. And ultimately, they rejected God himself. And they did not do what was right in his eyes. Can I say this very lovingly tonight if you're a Christian? As you look at your own relationship with God and as I look at mine, make sure that you don't neglect his word. Sometimes in the busyness of life, sometimes in our pursuit of other things to be the best at this, the best of that, 
Sometimes in our pursuit for other things, our relationship with God suffers, and sometimes the first thing to go is God's Word. We end up not only neglecting it, but we end up rejecting it. That's exactly what these people did. Child of God, make sure the Word of God is central to everything in your life. If you neglect the Word of God, the time will come when you and you and I will simply do what is right in our own eyes. You know, Jeremiah the prophet, speaking about his day, said this, every city had its own God. Every city had its own God. God's people were worshiping idols, objects they had made with their own hands. They had built altars in the cities, their own homes, they were steeped in idolatry and they worshipped gods of their own making. And everything about this people was stamped with religion. But the religion was external. It had no depth to it. And they didn't have a relationship with God. Do you know what Jesus would later say about those people? He said, these people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What a great statement that is. Is it not true generally of the world in which we live tonight? Is it not true of the nation of which we are a part? So much religion, so much idolatry, and very little true worship of God. You meet with a group of people, you talk about your faith, they will say, I have my own church. I have my own religion. I live according to my own standards. And so many people tonight can take religion or leave it, and yet say that one day they'll still be in heaven. Well, let me say this and make it perfectly clear. It's not religion that will get any of us to heaven. It's not about a church. It's not about a creed. It's not about a catechism. It's not about our confirmation or any other church ordinance. It's about Christ. We thought about this this morning, didn't we? when we thought about Acts 2 and we said that whenever Peter preached to the people of his day, he turned around and he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What scope? The offer was extended to everybody. There were none who weren't included. But even though it was extended to everybody, they had to come the one way. For neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. I know we live in days when the great religious leaders in our world will tell us all roads lead to heaven. I say this very reverently, but that's a lie. That's a lie. You'll never find that in the Word of God. But you will hear the Son of God saying, I am the way, the only way. I am the truth. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall come in and out and find pasture. The Lord Jesus Christ says, listen, all roads do not lead to heaven. I am the way. And if men and women choose to go another way, they don't have to wait until they stand on the verge of eternity to know that they're lost. You can tell them tonight, sadly, that they're lost by choosing to do their own thing and by choosing to go their own way instead of following Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. We often sing with the children in the church on a Sunday morning, one way 
God says to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way. Let me ask you tonight very reverently, are you a saved person or are you a religious person? There's a great difference. You say, what's the problem, Pastor? I mean, the end of the day, you come to this church, you're always at this church, this is your church. Isn't this why you come? No, I don't come because this is my church. I come to meet with God through faith in Jesus Christ. This is about not a religion, this is about a relationship. W.E. Sangster said this, the heart of religion is not an opinion but it's a personal relationship with God. One of the most religious men we read of in the Scriptures is a man called Nicodemus. This man was religious. He was a leader of the Jews. He was probably a member of the Sanhedrin. And yet there was something in his soul that wasn't right. There was something about his religion that didn't add up. And at night he came to Jesus and he said, Master, you must be a man sent from God that you can do all these things that we are witnessing. And a conversation ensued. And this religious man talked with Jesus and Jesus talked with him. And then Jesus turned around and he said to him, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus realized religion was not enough. What he needed to do was to be born of God. He wasn't sure about that, and the conversation ensues. And he says to Jesus, well, how can a man be born again in his mother's womb the second time? And Jesus had to explain this to him. It's not about natural birth. It's about a spiritual birth. No man can live Godward until he has been born again of the Holy Spirit. Friends, in God's sight, we're all sinners, all of us. And we cannot have fellowship with God the way we are we're separated from God because of our sin. That sin needs to be dealt with. Our fallen nature needs to be replaced with a new nature. Our first birth needs to be replaced with a second birth. And these hearts that are deceitful and desperately wicked need to be changed. God's people had religion and riches, but they still were far from God. There's the peril of riches, the peril of religion. Very quickly, there's the peril of righteousness, and by that I mean our own self-righteousness. Look at verse 11. The lofty looks of man, the prophet says, shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Now, I know that that day Isaiah talks about is a day away in the future. I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking here simply about the peril of righteousness. These people were full of pride. They were full of their own self-righteousness. And they thought that that was enough to please God. They were puffed up, and they didn't realize that soon God would bring them down. They were taken up with their own resources, and they didn't see that they needed spiritual help. They were trusting in themselves instead of God, and Isaiah warned them, listen, there's a day coming when you're going to be brought down from your lofty place. You're going to be humbled in the sight of God and the Lord alone in that day will be exalted. God's people Israel had the same problem in earlier days. In fact, in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul had to deal with this issue. Romans 4, he goes back to the Old Testament and he 
gives us an illustration and an explanation. There were those who thought that Abraham was chosen by God because of his character, because of who he was, because of what he did. Now, Abraham was an important man. And Abraham was a well-known figure as far as Jewish history was concerned. But the reason why Abraham was accepted by God was this. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. In other words, God bestowed righteousness on Abraham as a free gift. No merit on his part. Nothing that he did could have earned it. He simply believed God and took him at his word. You know, friends, you and I can never be saved by our works. The only work that can save us is the finished work of Christ on the cross. You and I can never be saved by anything we do or by what we are. As sinners, we can only be saved through the precious blood that Jesus Christ shared on the cross at Calvary for sinners like us. That's it. Some today will have told their people they need to work to get to heaven. Others may have said you need to pay to get to heaven. Jesus Christ simply says, it is finished. Payment has been made. Your debt is clear. You get to heaven through me. You say, but how can that be? Well, when you come to Christ, something wonderful happens. God removes the filthy rags of our sin, casts them into the sea of his forgetfulness. He replaces those filthy rags with the righteousness of his own son. The apostle Paul said it like this, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You might be sitting here tonight or sitting at home and saying to me, Pastor, hold on a moment. Are you saying to me that I have worked all my life to be a better person, to get to a better place, and I'm not going there? Yes. There's nothing wrong with seeking to be a better person, longing for a better place, you can't get to heaven without Christ. You need to be saved. You need to come with all your own self-righteousness and all the filthy rags that adorn this life of mine and bow at the foot of the cross and look to him who died to save us and say, I do believe, I will believe that Jesus died for me. That's it. The moment you do that in common repentance and in faith, God will remove your filthy rags of sin. They'll be remembered no more forever. God will clothe you in the righteousness of his Son, adopt you into his family, and you'll enjoy fellowship with God like you've never experienced before. We're going to sing in a moment, My Hope is Built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. There's the pearl of riches. No matter how much we own or accumulate, it can never bring peace with God. There's the pearl of religion. It's not religion that we need. It's a personal relationship with God through faith in Christ. The pearl of righteousness. If we depend on our own righteousness and our own good works, we miss the point. Jesus Christ has done it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's all I have for heaven. But that's all I need. It's finished. The battle's over. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. But you must come to Jesus 
who died, rose again, and lives today so that you and I might be saved. Let's sing this lovely hymn and think about the words as we close. If you're going out to the mission, please do watch the roads. But let's just bow together in prayer after we sing this lovely hymn. My hope is built on nothing less. Thank you tonight that you've made it clear in your word the way of salvation. There are many things we have in life, but the one thing we really need is a relationship with you through faith in Jesus Christ. May we be sure that we have this relationship, and if not, that tonight we might sort this matter out with God. Bless us as we part, take us to our homes in safety. Remember the YF as they meet together. Bless all those young people and the leaders as they meet for fellowship. Watch over us this day and all our days until Jesus comes or calls. We ask it all in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen.